Hey, this is Dr. Night Class. Go ahead and click like and subscribe below. Hope you enjoy the medical content. Okay, transport of glucose and insulin potassium relationship. There's two topics we're talking about. The first on the left is transport of glucose. So glucose, yes, close relationship to insulin, right? When glucose is present, insulin is in business. It's in business, right? Business is good. Okay, so here's the lumen. Here's the small intestines. Here's the blood. This is the area of the brush border enzymes who live in the small intestines, okay? We know things are absorbed in their smallest form. So disaccharides like lactose, they're not absorbed in the small brush border because they're not small enough. We need to break them down to monosaccharides like glucose, like galactose, like fructose, okay? When I see fructose, I see os, which means sugar. I see F-R-U-C-T, which is five letters. That reminds me it's GLUT5, okay? Fructose is absorbed with GLUT5. It's important for spermatogenesis we'll talk about when we cover re uh, repro. Galactose comes from breast milk or milk itself. And glucose, we get it all over the place in Western civilization. It's easy to find. They're going to share the same transporter. This is GLUT1. You could think of, or excuse me, SGLT1. Okay, you could think of one because these are the primary sources of glucose for us. They're the primary sources. GL2 is going to absorb all of these monosaccharides fructose, galactose, and glucose. GL2 because it's the second site of transporters. Here's the first site of transporters on the lumen. The second site of transporters are, bet are at the brush border where GLUT2 is going to be second site. Okay. Now, who's powering all of this? How are sodiums and glucose able to go from the lumen all the way to the blood? We need a battery. You need a battery, right? Someone that's generating ATP. And what do you have up here? You have sodium potassium pump, right? It's creating a gradient. So glucose could come down its gradient with sodium and it could enter into the blood. Same with galactose, could do the same thing. All right, we call that secondary active transport. No time now to forget those things, right? It's not time to forget those things. Glucose, it's finally made it into the blood. What do you want to do with it? The first thing we do when we get glucose in our blood, do we use it right away or do we store it? We actually store it. We store it right away, okay? Like the way you see a squirrel, a nut hits the ground, it fell out of the tree. Does the squirrel eat the nut right away? No, it grabs the nut, it brings it back to its nest and stores it. And then when it's hungry, it'll eat it, right? It's the same way when glucose gets into the body, we use insulin, which is anabolic, to store it, to build something, right? So to get glucose into the cell, insulin, the second messenger, is going to be present. As you see the phone here, it's a tyrosine kinase, okay? It's going to make a call into the nucleus. And the nucleus is going to send a protein called GLUT4. It's going to send it out to the plasma membrane, which is going to take in glucose. The same story is going to happen in skeletal muscle. All the same receptors, all the same enzymes like hexokinase is going to be present in skeletal muscle. It's the same in the lipids. In the lipids, glucose is going to enter same story, GLUT4 and hexokinase. So what do I mean here by that has a low KM? Does anybody remember? To get glucose into the cell, you need to trap it. And the way you trap glucose into the cell is you add a phosphate. Okay? You make it glucose 6 phosphate, right? So a hexokinase is going to add the phosphate 
It does it at the skeletal muscle. It does it in the lipid storage. Hexokinase having a low KM means that it doesn't even have to be a high level of substrate or a high level of glucose. Since it has a, am I saying this right? It has a, oh gosh, I have a brain fart. Since it has a low KM, it has a high affinity. It has a high affinity, okay? It has a high affinity to take glucose in and trap it. Skeletal muscle and lipids will get glucose energy stores first because of hexokinase having a low KM and high affinity, as opposed to what? Because everything's in relativity, right? Everything's in relativity, okay? As opposed to the liver, as opposed to the liver. So when glucose enters into the liver, it has a different enzyme that traps glucose into the liver. It's called glucokinase. It has a high KM, so that means it has a low affinity. So glucose levels, the substrate has to be very high in order for glucose to be taken up by the liver. It has to be very high, okay? The same way that ACTH has to be very high for melanocyte stimulating hormones to make melatonin. If it's normal level, it's gonna go to the adrenal glands, you're gonna make things like cortisol, okay? All right, so insulin and potassium relationship. That's over here on the right, okay? All right, so if there's a diabetic, they come into the hospital, they have very high sugar levels, they forgot to take their insulin. So what's the treatment? Give them insulin, right? Simple fix. So we give the patient insulin. We give the patient insulin. But when we give the patient insulin, it activates a sodium potassium ATP pump. It activates a sodium potassium ATP pump, right? And you think that's fine. That's normal. Okay. No big deal. But when insulin touches its receptor, on the cell, it's going to drive glucose into the cell, but it does something else. It's going to push potassium into the cell, meaning that in the plasma, in the extracellular fluid, potassium lowers. Potassium becomes very low. So as what I'm trying to say is, if a patient comes in in, let's say, diabetic ketoacidosis, where they have very, very high glucose levels and very high sugar levels in the blood, right? We give them insulin to, to fix it, right? We have to monitor their potassium levels. We have to because their potassium levels will drop very quickly, okay? So we measure their potassium levels when we give insulin because of the sodium potassium pump. Now, why is it a problem to have low potassium levels? Potassium is the major cation responsible for repolarization. You've seen it, right? You've seen potassium run inside a cell and do repolarization. Have we seen this? We've seen it, right? So if there's a problem with repolarization, let's look at this. If there's a problem with repolarization, can you depolarize? Because first you depolarize, and then you repolarize, and then you depolarize, and then you repolarize. But if you have a problem with repolarizing, you're not able to fire an action potential and then reset it. You can't reset it, right? There'll be a delay. So if there's a problem with potassium levels, would you expect that there'll be a problem with the heart rate and rhythm? Yes, you would. You would expect a problem with the heart rate and rhythm because things like the QRS complex is dependent on potassium levels, okay? Remember, we have to depolarize and then repolarize the heart for rate and rhythm. But if there's a problem with repolarization, 
it could prolong a QRS. It could totally do that. And then we have a bigger problem, right? So we have to be very careful with measuring potassium levels because it's a repolarization cation and it can affect the heart's rate and rhythm, okay? So if we lower potassium too fast by giving insulin, we can mess up the heart, all right? So that's the takeaway. That's why when we treat a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis, Sometimes we're correcting the glucose levels with insulin, but we lower the potassium levels too fast. So then we keep giving insulin, but we add potassium. We start giving them potassium because the potassium levels drop very quickly. Okay? You'll see that in step two. Step two and then also your first year residency. For more night class content, go ahead and email me at drnightclass at gmail.com. That's D-O-C-T-R nightclass gmail.com. Hope you enjoy the content.